I'm Tom Thomas. I want to welcome you back to the show, How to Beat the Odds. I'm excited about the show today. Don Dickerman has been on our show before, and we've had more phone calls in response to what he had to say on How to Beat the Odds than any other show. His ministry is a deliverance ministry, and people are beginning to realize they need to get free. Even Christians who say, well, I can't have a demon. The Holy Spirit lives in me. How can a demon possess me? They can't possess a Christian, but they can oppress you. They can be present. They will manifest themselves and oppress us, cause us to think thoughts that we shouldn't think, do things we shouldn't do. My wife and I went through deliverance. Everyone needs to go to deliverance. You say, well, why would I need to go to deliverance? What have I ever done to attract demons in my life? You might not have done anything except be born hmm. because generational curses are real, passed on down from third and fourth generations. The Bible says the iniquities of the father will be passed down. It says in Exodus 20, right in the middle of the Ten Commandments. It's a true statement. Hmm. And we don't know what our ancestors were involved in too. And if it can be passed on down to us, let's get rid of it. Let's get free from it. A lot of times we do things we don't know why we're doing them. I mean, medical doctors that say we're depressed or we have this or we have that, they don't look at it as a spiritual problem. But many times it is. Well, you've been watching Inside Sky Angel for several weeks. If you've seen it, you realize it talked about Mark Chapman who killed John Lennon. Well, that's what this show's about. Because my guest today, Don Dickerman, has been ministering to him, Mark Chapman, since 1971. And we're going to have some roll-ins of Mark Chapman talking about some of the things that happened, an actual shooting of John Lennon and how it happened and the circumstances around it. Well, right now, let's say hello once again to Don Dickerman. Don, welcome to the show. Thank you, Tommy. It's good to be here again. Well, we had an awesome time a couple of weeks ago. Uh, you have a, a monthly, every three, three months, you have a get-together here in Colleyville. Right. People come from three or four states around. Yeah. And you minister and have deliverance, and you asked me to speak that night. We had an awesome time, didn't yes, we? Yes, we did. Also, you had people ask a lot of questions that night about demons and all, and we're going to do some filming, and you're going to answer those questions and put it together in a DV, DVD, right. and that'll be available for people who want it. Good, yes, absolutely. So I'm telling people that are watching the show that I'll give you his email address and how you can contact him, and if you would want that DVD to answer these questions, he'd be happy to send it to yes. you. I don't know what you're going to charge for it. I don't know anything about that, but I, they can contact I don't either. You. Yeah, we'll, we'll decide. It's not about through. making money. No. It's about getting the truth out there. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, now, Mark Chapman, you met him in 1971, I believe? 81. 1981. 81. Okay. How did that happen? You know, uh, it, it's kind of strange, Tommy. I, I've been going into prisons now since uh, 1974 and have been in uh, over 850 different prisons and uh, probably been inside prisons more than 2,000 times to minister. And uh, obviously from those visits, I would get a lot of mail from inmates and uh, sometimes just stacks of mail. And um, always respond to it. I answer every letter uh, personally. And one day um, I had in, in the stack of mail a letter from a guy named Mark David Chapman. I didn't know who he was. It was just mixed in with... Uh, a lot of other letters and one of my sons who was a teenager at the time said dad do you know who that is uh, I said no he said that's the man that shot John Lennon uh, well I, I didn't know that I read the letter responded to Mark and uh, we became friends first through the mail then I went to visit Mark and and have have visited him several times but uh, that's how it all started was a, a letter from Mark who had gotten one of our newsletter publications that we sent out to, uh, I don't know, maybe 10,000 different inmates, but someone had gotten one to him. And that's how we initially met, uh, was through the mail. Mark uh, shared with me a lot of things that um, probably nobody else knows about his life and uh, eventually uh, gave us an exclusive interview. This, is, this has never been seen anywhere the interview that, that you'll see today. Uh, and Mark, it was part of Mark's conditions that this would not be, <clears throat> excuse me, not be on public TV and not be used for the wrong reasons. He wanted, um, he wants people to see 
uh, how his life was, what brought him to that point, and how his life has changed since then. And so what we're sharing today is a little bit of uh, what most people don't know about, about Mark Chapman. Well, now he was born again at an early age, I believe, at his grandmother's house. Mark actually accepted Christ um, in his grandmother's home uh, on one of his, um, I guess you'd call it one of his uh, down moments when he had run away from home and was spending time with his grandmother. He's a different individual than, than most people. Uh, Mark struggled with depression uh, probably from age 12 uh, up until now. He had struggled with depression and uh, was diagnosed as uh, paranoid with grandiose uh, uh, feelings and ideas. And, uh, but he, he was in and out of depression. Uh, even though he was saved at 14 and lived for the Lord, and, and Mark would tell you, would tell anybody, you can't talk me out of this. I know I accepted Christ when I was 14. I know I was saved. Um, he followed him for a couple of years. Yes, he? yeah, he did. Uh, youth camps and he worked in YMCA's as, uh, as, a, as a youth leader. But uh, he, he would slip in and out of, of depression. And, you know, I, I, can, um, I can relate a little bit to that because my mom, who loved the Lord, was without doubt born again, read her Bible, uh, loved us and directed us as children was also diagnosed as uh, paranoid schizophrenic and struggled. Uh, my mother attempted suicide nine times in a six week period. And uh, I, you know, I, I'm not gonna talk about that. She's, uh, she's been dead several years and she's with the Lord, but she struggled as a believer. And I didn't know what I know now about demons. Uh, I, I could have brought her some freedom through what, what I, I know now, but she was tormented and uh, Mark was tormented in a little different way, but uh, saved, but had some problems in his life. And uh, I think it was, um, I don't remember the exact age when Mark uh, decided he was going to commit suicide. And the same demons of murder that wanted to kill him worked in his life to kill someone else. Mark sold all of his possessions, bought a ticket to Hawaii with the intentions of committing suicide in Hawaii. And um, when he got there, he rented a car, drove up to a mountainous area overlooking the ocean, and had, had purchased a cheap vacuum cleaner hose, attached it to the exhaust of his car, and was going to just go to sleep and die. That was, he, he was, he was hopeless in life. He couldn't find peace. But uh, while he was dozing off, a fisherman uh, noticed him, knocked on the window, woke him up and took him out of his suicide attempt. attempt. And uh, Mark uh, made his way to a, a hospital. They um, treated him, got him in some psychiatric treatment and he eventually became stable and, and actually went to work for that hospital. But still, he was struggling. There were times when he could work and function normally and all, and then other times of depression and all yeah. would come on. And, and what Mark would tell you today uh, is I have been mentally ill and I have dealt with dem demons. And uh, he says they're two different things. But I think the, the reality is that the demons are behind the mental illness the demons um, in, in Mark's testimony drove him not only to kill John Lennon, he sought demons to help him do it. Uh, actually wow. prayed to Satan. Uh, while, while at the same time being a believer. And this is a complicated part of uh, scriptural doctrine for people. It's hard to accept. Mark, I think, has tried to explain why he did what he did uh, and it's, it's, never, it's never adequate, you know, when you're thinking about uh, explaining why you did such a horrible thing. But Mark said he was reading a book, um, and it, 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 he was not a Beatles fan in the, in the sense of being a crazed fan like a lot of them were. He liked their music, and um, he liked what they, they preached through their music, a simple lifestyle. And uh, 
Mark read a book about John Lennon that uh, showed that he wasn't really living a simple lifestyle, that he was lavished and, you know, and uh, somehow that hit Mark wrong. He, he said he felt betrayed and he felt like he had given his life to a, to, um, a lifestyle that uh, the, the man who was preaching it was not living it. And uh, I think it was then that the demons began to work in, Mar in Mark's heart. Mark said, I felt like he needed to die. John Lennon needed to die. Well, let's do this. Let's do a roll in and hear him talk about that. And then we'll come back and elaborate on that. All right. Great. Let's do that roll in. Okay. So you're, you're at the Honolulu Public Library and, and right. you found this book uh, called One Day at a Time. One Day at a Time. Okay. And uh, were you, was it by Lennon or about Lennon? About Lennon. Okay. Was it wasn't written by him. Okay. So I get this book and I bring it home and uh, I get very angry at John Lennon mm -hmm. because I see these pictures of him at the top of this uh, very exclusive uh, condominium, I guess, in Manhattan. Mm -hmm. I didn't even know where he was and I didn't go in the library looking for him, Yeah. but I found him in that book yeah. for what I thought was him. Yeah. We can't judge people by photographs, but that's what I did then. Mm -hmm. And I judged him, uh, and uh, judged him very harshly. We had a different picture of him uh, from the music. You, yeah, that's and it. the message of the music. That's right. I, I took what he was doing as hypocrisy, mm -hmm. when all along I was probably the bigger yeah. hypocrite. Yeah. Uh, and I got angry that he was uh, living in this splendor and he had uh, sang about peace mm -hmm. and about love. And remember my frame of mind at this time, I am uh, depressed and I am getting paranoid and I'm getting to where I'm thinking people are talking about me on the bus. Mm -hmm. As you were saying earlier, here's where the demons really started applying the screws. Mm -hmm. Although I don't blame them for, for what happened. Well, your life became open to it. It uh, became open. Again, I wasn't serving the Lord, wasn't seeking Him. I'm in my apartment and I'm alone. The book is on the counter. Mm -hmm. And I'm holding the album Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band album, which is one of their popular ones from the 60s. Mm -hmm. And if you open it up, You'll see against the yellow background is all four of them in, uh, in like military regalia, you know, different color uniforms. Hmm. And I'm looking at them, and I look at John, and I remember what's in the book, and the two just came together. Mm -hmm. Here's the John that uh, you know I knew and loved, and the Beatles that I knew and yeah, loved. Yeah. And here's the John in the book, and they just came crashing together, hmm. and that was the first time in my mind. Again, here's right. Mr. Nobody. Yeah. The first time in my mind that, that murder entered into my mind. Mm. Well, you're right. That's when he first experienced murder. It came into his mind, and he thought about murder. Yeah, and he wrestled with it. You know, he he knew he he had enough uh, spiritual conviction in him, as even a lost person would know that was the wrong thing to do. But he wrestled with it. Um, Mark even went to New York with the intentions of doing it and uh, was at the Dakota building where John Lennon lived with his wife, uh, Yoko uh, Ono. And um, it was his intention to kill him on that first trip to New York. But he said, I was a coward. I couldn't do it. I rationalized. And uh, he actually went back to Hawaii. And um, his wife told him, said, Mark, you, this is demonic. The things you're thinking about and talking about, they're, they're demonic. And, uh, Mark couldn't see it. At the same time, uh, he couldn't turn loose the thought, I need to do this. I need to be the one to do it. Uh, he said, I was driven. And so he, he eventually went back to New York. Uh, he'd never get on a plane today, you know, but had his pistol with him uh, and... Um, went back to kill him. Went back to kill him. Well, let's do a roll in and let him talk about it, and then we'll come back and talk about right. it some more. I came in on Saturday and spent the whole day Sunday, mm -hmm. Sunday, uh, watching, waiting for him. 
and then I came back Monday. Now, now you had a loaded 38. That's right. Special mm -hmm. under your uh, over pocket of my overcoat. The pocket of your overcoat. Now, when I came there Monday morning, when I left the hotel room, rather, uh, I knew, I knew that this was the day, and I hadn't even seen him. Mm -hmm. But I knew that he was there. I was standing, uh, or I was sitting rather, in the uh, archway of the building, and I could see the corner of Central Park West and then the street. And again, I knew something strange. I knew that that was his limousine. Now, a lot of limousines go up and down Central Park West, mm -hmm. but I knew that was his. And it turned and it came to the front of the building. And here's what happened. I stood up and I said to myself, this is it. Yoko got out of the car and she started ahead. And she passed by me. She looked at me. I don't know if she recognized me or not, but she walked past me. And they're going toward the front door of the... Well, she is at this point. She's about you... 20 feet ahead of John Lennon. Okay. So she passes me uh, through the archway and into the security uh, door of the mm -hmm. building, and uh, John Lennon comes out, and he passes me, and uh, I don't remember, but I think I nodded to him, and uh, or something like that. And after he passed me, mm -hmm. uh, I turned. I think he recognized you. He may have. Yeah, he may have. Wondered what the heck's he still mm -hmm. doing here? Right. You know. And uh, I was there under the pretense of getting Yoko Ono's signature on the album, but that's um, not what I asked her yeah, for when right. she came out of the car. So she went past me and then he passed me and I turned and uh, at his back, mm -hmm. fired into his back, five rounds from the mm -hmm. uh, Charter Arms pistol. Mm -hmm. how, how close was it when you fired the first shot? Did you just turn I'd say about 10, 10 to 12 feet. Did he, did he fall immediately to the ground? What? No. Uh, what happened was uh, he still had some com some composure, hmm. and he went uh, into the uh, door of the security booth and up the stairs and then collapsed. I didn't see any of that. I must have turned around. Yeah. But you didn't uh, run though, right? No, I didn't run. Didn't want to run. Couldn't couldn't have run. Yeah. Uh, I just stood there. I took out a book, a paperback novel, mm. uh, called The Catcher in the Rye by yeah. J.D. Salinger. That's another thing right. I was obsessed with, yeah. uh, thinking I was a character in that book. Right. And stood there and started reading that book. Just, I was nervous, but I was reading the book and just kind of pacing up and down. Mm. That's a brutal way to kill somebody. In the back, shot him five yeah. times. Yeah. And, uh, you know, when you talk to Mark about this, um, he'll he'll talk about how sorry he is and how how he would give anything if he hadn't done it, and you know all all the things that uh, probably anybody would think. He's not proud of what he did. Uh, he called himself a coward. He said I couldn't shoot him when he was looking at me. Uh, he said I had to had to wait till he turned his back. But one one of the things you know Mark said is after I did it. It was such an empty feeling of now what you know. He, he said it was like I had, I had been betrayed, and um, I had carried out this sinister plot, and now I didn't I didn't know what to do. He said I just stood there with the with the worst feeling you can imagine. The reality of what he had done set in. He said I was immediately paranoid of people killing me and. He said even when the police came and finally put him in the police car, you know, he said, I was ducking down. I thought people would be shooting at me when they well, got the news. Millions love John Lennon and the oh, Beatles. Yeah. yeah. And Mark's still in prison, you know. Uh, right. I don't know that he'll ever get out of prison. And you know, for whatever reason, Tommy, God has put um, inmates into my life that um, have, have a... I guess an infamous background like David Berkowitz and Mark Chapman, 
Carla Faye Tucker, uh, we'll, and we'll, we'll talk about her life. We're going to be doing a show about her in a couple of weeks. Yeah, uh, Carla Faye, her story is different. They're all different, but they're all they're all the same in the, in the sense that these people were driven. Uh, there was something that had opened a door into their life, and in Carla Faye's, it, it was drugs and a, a a broken home and that type of thing. But I, I've I've been blessed to see it firsthand to see the before and the after. And, uh, you know, you, people could argue about um, whether or not a Christian can have a demon, and they do theological arguments about it. But you can never talk me out of it. Because well, you've seen deliverance. I've seen it. I see it d virtually daily, thousands of people. And just believers that, that need to be free, and Jesus paid for it. So uh, in the life of Mark Chapman and these other people, I, I see the reality of it. And, you know, you don't ever want to get to the point you, where you say the devil made them do it. You always have the option to make decisions. And, but um, there, there is a reality that in this world, we, we deal with demonic powers. And I don't, I don't fear them. I don't, uh, and I don't give them much respect. Um, I fear the Lord. You know, and I, Amen. <laughs> and I and I trust the Lord Jesus, uh, but I do see it. I see people in in demonic strongholds that don't know how to get out. Wow, you're watching the show. You say, "Oh, come on now, I'm not going for that." He killed so and so, so and so. Why? That's just who he was, or raised had this attitude, that attitude, just mean, honorary. Let me tell you something. Columbine High School. Young people went in and killed other young people. These were not hardened criminals. They weren't robbing a bank and killed somebody in the midst of a bank robbery. Or they're not assassins paid to go kill somebody. These are kids killing other kids. How do you think that happened? I know how it happened. Mm -hmm. The powers of darkness got a foothold in their life yeah. and led them into whatever it was. Yeah, yeah. you see, and, and that's, the, that's the great thing really about uh, life is that God gives us a will and um, and we can yield to what whatever we choose, but when you're when a person becomes blinded or hurt or traumatized uh, by the events of life, or like you mentioned, Columbine uh, or any of those type of events, they're generally misfits. They don't they 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 they're looking, they're searching, they want to be loved, and um, and I think you could say that for Mark Chapman, is that uh, <clears throat> he would say he was a misfit. And um, he was a nobody. Uh, and the, the lie was, if you do something bizarre, and here's you an opportunity, here's, here's a guy who betrayed you, and he's an icon, and so on. Um, you believe the lie, and that's the power of the demon, is believing their lie. As long as we don't believe their lie, they're powerless. So truth sets you free, because truth is what uh, God can honor. And a lie, a simple lie, if you believe a lie that you're no good, that you're a misfit and you don't belong and God doesn't love you, and you start receiving those lies, uh, they'll lead to another lie and another lie. Well, God, you know, people will love you if you do this and if you make some noise. And so uh, the reality is, is we don't have to be in bondage as believers. We really can be free. And it's really not complicated. You know, Mark wrote a, a, a testimony, his personal testimony. We have it right here, and we'll send this to anybody who wants it, by the yeah. way. Uh, it's just his handwritten, um, printed testimony, but it, it's, um, it's, it's pretty compelling. And um, Mark would not want any glory. I, that's what I know. That's why he didn't want this, this exclusive footage uh, on public TV and uh, network TV. Uh, he doesn't want to exploit um, what he did. It's, uh, he said, I, I did it, and if, if somehow God can use my testimony today for his glory, uh, he said, you can have it. So he gave this to me with those conditions. Would you pray for the folks watching sure, our show? Sure. Uh, Father, I know it's your desire and your will that, uh, that believers be free. And so I ask you in Jesus' name to just by the, the power and presence of your Holy Spirit to minister to every heart watching right now 
And I pray they'd not only come to know complete freedom uh, from their sin, but freedom from the power of the enemy that's there by permission of that sin. And Father, we thank you for this. We thank you for Tommy and for this program and for every home and every life it's touching. And we thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Don, good to have you back on the show. Thank you, Tommy. Good to have you watching the show today. Don's written several books, Serpents in the Sanctuary. What are some of the others? Turmoil in the Temple and uh, uh, Protected by Angels, uh, Keys to Liberated Living. Okay, now these books will inform you about demons in the sanctuary, some of the methods they have to try to get an inroad into our lives, and about angels. Angels are warring for us. Yeah. There's a whole spiritual realm we can't see, but God's Word gives us a revelation of what's going on out there. Yes. But we don't understand it all, but I can testify it's real. And I've seen the deliverances that Don has done. We've seen miracles. A young man came and, and was a diabetic. Mm -hmm. And my wife administered to his mother in the yeah. jail. She's now a Christian counselor. We were leaving when he came in for yeah. deliverance. Right. The young man got delivered. He was a football player, serious diabetic. Yeah. What did the doctor say? No evidence of it completely healed, free, no longer a diabetic. It really works. Anyway, I encourage you, I'll put Don's email address up, Don Dickerman at, what, dondickerman.com? Yeah, it's Don at dondickerman.com. Don at dondickerman.com. Contact him, get some of the books, they'll be a blessing to you. If we live in this area, two or three states around, he'll have a deal on his website when his next meeting is. I wanna encourage you to go to the meeting. It's an awesome time of ministry. Thanks for watching our show. My wife, Latrice, and I, there will be a number at the end if you want to call. We'll pray for you. We'll see you next time on How to Beat the Odds. Need to hear somebody testify. I need to hear somebody say that you were lost and at the bottom and you could not find your way. Just when life had lost all meaning And you wish that you could die Jesus came to you that day You invited him to stay I need to hear somebody testify Were you born to some good?